Hey everybody, how's it going? So, yeah, I'm using the Sony AX53 camera. One thing I noticed is that my DJI, which actually costs one quarter what this thing costs, has better image stabilization. The reason I use this is because it has a mic input that will power a microphone that requires plug power. So I use a DPA4065 and it requires plug power. So just having a mic adapter won't work. It has to get supplied like three or five volts. And that would require using an external recorder I don't feel like syncing audio and video between external recorders. That's a royal pain in the ass. And it's not something that I want to deal with. But it is really interesting how technology has evolved. Because this camcorder used to be like 11 or 1200 bucks when it came out. I got this thing for about, like, uh, I think, like six or 700 used a long time ago. And a $260 camera kicks the crap out of it in every single way. And what's interesting with cameras and how they evolve is this camera still sells for what it retailed for five years ago. Even though there's been no change in the technology, no updates whatsoever, which is kind of sad, but I guess it is what it is. You know, I, I've noticed that, you know, phone cameras and action cameras get progressively better with each passing year or every six months or each year, whereas actual camera equipment seems to be really, really slow to catch up. Like this thing has a, like, you know, a gimbal that's mounted inside of it for the sensor on the AX53. It has a gimbal mounted inside the sensor. And in spite of that, it actually has worse, uh, worse image stabilization when I'm walking with a, uh, one of these little um, monopods than when you walk with a DJI. Anyway, when I did that video with Rich uh, yesterday, we did about a three hour long podcast. I'm not sure where or when he's going to release that. It was pretty fun. He's a funny guy. One of the questions that came up is, what is one of the things that makes New York City good? Or do you think it would be good for people aspiring and starting out? And I think it deserves its own video. Because I do think there are some things that make New York City good that get lost when I talk about all the things that make New York City suck. So one of the things that I think makes New York City an amazing, one-of-a-kind place by far, is that if you are willing to put in 12 to 15 hours of work every single day, of honest work, not like, you know, checking Facebook, checking your phone, screwing around, smoking a joint, messing around with your friends, but like you actually want to put all that work. There's a lot of opportunity here. I'm not sure how true that is now in contrast to the past, if you're trying to build something from scratch, but if you're willing to put in a lot of work, there actually is 12 to 15 hours a day of work for you to do here. And if you're willing to find it, you can find it and you, it, it's there. So if you have an idea, if you're in a town, let's say, I don't know, like Custer, South Dakota, you've got a population of like two or 3,000 people in Custer, South Dakota, nice people. I am not saying anything bad about them. It's just you're in a town of 2,000 people. So you may have an idea for, for a re that's uh, revolutionary. There may be people that need your service. You may be good at providing that service, but because you're in a town of 2,000 people, you may actually be good at providing that service. You may have the time to provide that service. It may be a revolutionary service, but if the 2,000 people around you don't need it to the point where you can make a living with it, then the idea doesn't really work. Even though the cost of living is less, uh, if there's far fewer people that actually need whatever it is that you're offering to the point where uh, you know, nobody is coming to you for whatever that product or service is, it doesn't really matter anymore. Whereas in New York City, let's say your rent is four times as much, but if you have 50 times as many people willing to come to you for something, or 100 times as many people willing to come to you for something, that means that you actually have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to do something, to start a business, to become a freelancer, to become an entrepreneur. So let's say that, you know, in South Dakota, I don't know, let's say there's, let's say you, you have 100 times more opportunity in New York City because of the population density, and you have 20 customers. I mean, you divide that by 100 and you get 0.2 people. 0.2 is not even one person, so you have nobody who needs your service. Uh, you know, kind of like back of the napkin math there. But ho hopefully you get my point. There is a lot of opportunity in New York City, at least I think there was when I was starting out, that you're just not going to find in some small town. And regardless of what you see when you see, you know, the streets being dirty or things being overpriced or the politics being a joke or the, uh, the regulation regarding permits for everything and the city trying to nickel and dime you every single which way you get, at the end of the day, the opportunity that you have here, for some people, makes it worth it. And for me, at the very least in the beginning, before I had a reputation, before I had a single review on Yelp or Google or eBay or Facebook or any of that, before I had a single YouTube video, the ability to just go to a popular area, put up a couple of pull tab signs, put up a back page and a Kijiji and a Craigslist ad, and, have, and just have 
30 or 40 people calling me every single day was genuinely amazing. It, it was that, that's like a one of a kind thing that you're just not gonna find in a lot of other places in the US. Like I'm 19 years old, I'm wearing basketball shorts, you know, I'm, like, I'm working out of my, my crappy apartment in Staten Island and I would have dozens of people call me every single day simply because I put these signs in the right place. And that's amazing. And now, more, some of the other things that I could say about what makes New York City great, I, I really, I don't know how to tell other than through story. So I was working in this one particular recording studio a while ago, and it, was, it wasn't exactly the, you know, I wouldn't say it was the best recording studio in the world. The guy wound up closing and just opening one small room somewhere else. He used to have like 36 rooms. He wound up opening one small room somewhere else. And that place had about 13 rooms. And it was run by somebody who had a serious cocaine problem. So when he went to that studio, one of the things that I did was I told the person, my, my friend became the manager of it, and it was always a mess. Nothing ever worked there. I said, I'll make sure everything works here. You won't have to spend any money ever. In exchange, I want to be able to tell my, my customers, this is my office. I want them to be able to wait in this lobby, and I want to be able to use the space to store my stuff. Deal? Deal. Now, there was this one guy there. I remember his name. He, uh, my good friend Dino, he had a, like a rap sheet a mile long. He's from Louisiana. Really like gruff looking guy, a lot of tattoos, six foot five. I lost touch with him a few years ago, but he would always joke and clown on this one dude that had the most expensive studio in the back of the place. He would always go, and I forget the name of, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you the name of his studio. Uh, a, because I'd have to remember it, but B, also, if I do remember it, I don't really want to reveal who the person is, but he had a, he had a bunch, he was, he was like a multi-millionaire kind of guy. He had a, you know, he was a large record label executive in the late 90s and made a lot of money and one of the things that he he, he kind of was always about business he was always super hyper serious and Dino always tried to like kind of get a crack in his armor just get him to pretend he's human for a moment have a show an emotion or something and every time I would have a customer he would look at it and go man Louie making more money than XYZ studios and then the guy would just kind of have this grimace on his face like hmm Mm. And I, I, was, I was not making more money than him. I was making like, you know, one or two hundred dollars a day when I first started, if even. But if I was lucky. But that in and of itself kind of, uh, you know, he, he eventually, you know, got curious about my business. And he would ask around and everything. And, and one day I realized that he loaned 70,000 bucks to the coke head that ran the space because apparently he was about to, right about to get kicked out of the space the guy that had the studio in the back that was fancy had prepaid for years of rent so he was kind of thinking with that sunken cost fallacy which is if i don't give this guy a loan then i'm going to lose the money that i just put in so i might as well loan him more and i remember going to my friend jake having a conversation with him downing a bottle i figured it was southern comfort of Jürgenmeister. this is a long time ago I lost my shit. I just walked into that room. I walked past the guy. He had like two bodyguards or something with him. I just walked past him, completely drunk, out of my mind. I would never have had the balls to do this had I not been drinking. And I said, you gave that damn cokehead $70,000. Here is how much money this place would make if it was run right. Here's how much it makes run now. And here is how much the monthly expenses are. What the fuck made you think this was a good idea? You could have given me 10% of that and I would have built an empire with it. I remember throwing my liquor bottle down and it cracking. Um, something like that. I don't remember the whole thing. And then, you know, I remember him saying, you know, tell me more, tell me more. I think, you know, at first he seemed kind of mad that I ran up in a space, but at that point I think he was more concerned with, uh, like, just finally, he was coming to terms with the fact that he had lost six figures of money that he was never getting back that he gave to this person. And, like, he was, I guess I kind of forced him to come to terms with it in that moment. And the next day he uh, says, you know, Lewis, come back here. And I go to his office and he goes, he hands me a check and an agreement and he goes now build an empire with it it was either now do something with it or build an empire with it admittedly I forget it's been over 11 years gave me a loan for 7,000 bucks that's a, a, an ex-record label executive that loaned money to a coke head that I was doing maintenance work for for free and it, so that he wouldn't have pissed off clients and he could also continue spending money on his cocaine who only knew that my business was doing well and gained curiosity in it because this louisiana felon who was sleeping on the couch in exchange for watching the studio t would would joke and clown on him because he had a strict face my first business loan like where else in the country does that type of shit happen seriously where else in the country does that type of thing does that type of story just naturally occur 
And that's one of the things about New York that makes it so cool that there's so many scammers, there's so many, there's so many this lunacy going on, but if you're willing to be in the room, if you're willing to spend time in the rooms and you're willing to just get to know the people, be a fly on the wall, there's all sorts of crazy opportunities and crazy shit that can come your way in your late teenage years, in your early 20s. And, you know, as long, you know, there's a lot of bad decisions you can make here. Don't get, it, don't get me wrong. I've made a bunch of them. But there's a lot of really interesting ones. Another one was, you know, there was this one guy who was very insecure. His repair shop's gone now, but he used to get a lot of attention in the major newspapers, even though he didn't know how to fix anything. And I remember I would deliver him parts from time to time. And one day, there was actually, like, it was actually a really smart person working there. I'm just kind of wondering. Why is this guy that seems really smart, intelligent, knows all this shit working for this person? And, you know, he, t- he took me aside, went to a bar that day, and I asked him a couple of questions, and I'm just, like, kind of probing. Not, not saying it outright, but just, you know, like, what the fuck are you doing here, man? You're too talented for this. Also, I'm sorry if the camera was pointing at the floor. I wasn't paying attention. Hopefully that's better. Sorry about that. Now, this is really a podcast anyway, so if you were watching a video of me walking around three hotels in a row, you're... I don't, I don't know. Tw- look at something else. But... I, and I can remember kind of probing a little bit on it. And then he pulls up his jeans. And he shows me he's got a big ankle bracelet. One of those ankle bracelets that lets you know, lets them know where you are kind of thing. And he is waiting for sentencing to go to federal prison for some time. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he just wants something to do to pass the time. Because it's, it's, you know, it's kind of depressing and also like freaking him out with anxiety as to what's going to happen. Apparently, he was selling untaxed cigarettes and ketamine and all sorts of other... I mean, I, I, crazy story, but a really, really smart and intelligent guy. And he, you know, he, he would kind of bounce ideas off of me. I'd bounce ideas off of him. And he was just kind of working on this guy's business and trying to help him out just kind of as, a, as something to keep his mind busy. And he wound up taking it from like, you know, 12 to 20K a month all the way up to 100 to 120K a month in gross sales in a few, small amount of time. Pretty cool. A really, really smart guy. Really smart guy. And it, and it involved no ketamine and no untaxed cigarettes either. Anyway. <laughs> to, to continue it going. So he was talking about, you know, uh, display. I was, uh, my company really primarily worked with LCDs at the time. And, you know, uh, Rossman Supply Group was mainly into selling LCD screens. And he had an LCD screen supplier, and we just got to talking for, uh, a bit. He wound up quitting that place, and he had a bunch of ideas to run by me for LCD screen stuff. And there was uh, his supplier for the screen stuff also just happened to do board repair. So that guy uh, spoke to him about it, and then we, he, uh, he said, you should have to send this one customer's board to him to see what he does. You know, if he screws it up, I will pay to replace it for you, but you just try it. Uh, just trust me. And I send it, and he fixes the board for $65. And then eventually that guy wound up screwing things up horribly, but when he started screwing things up... But that was the prompt for me to realize that board repair is something that could actually be somewhat profitable. And then, then I realized it could also be 10 times more profitable. It was something that was actually done locally. So like the entire rabbit hole of me getting into doing board repair in-house happened because I was tired of that person screwing it up. I was tired of that screwy person screwing it up because their quality went down with time. I figured out that that person existed because I met a guy at a job that he shouldn't have been at because he was too smart for the job who was only there because he was about to go to prison because he sold ketamine and untaxed cigarettes. I mean, it's just like, where do you get this stuff from? I mean, this is just like, again, this is just, I'm not shitting on the small towns. I'm really not trying to shit on the small towns when I say this. And I hope it doesn't come off as condescending. But this is just not the type of shit that, like, these, these kind of friendships and these types of uh, acquaintanceships and these just kind of weird situations are just the kind of things that don't, it's hard for me to imagine that happening in Custer, South Dakota or Lincoln, Nebraska. You know, like, in those areas, it's more likely for me to imagine that someone gets a job at a local shop and just kind of works there for 10 to 20 years until they get something else. Or, you know, they work for their, you know, they work for their dad's friends, uncles, whatever, his construction company, and that's that. And, you know, there's a lot of crazy, weird-ass opportunities that pop up here because of the population density, because of the amount of money that's present in New York City, because of the amount of opportunity that's here. There's a bunch of people here. All those people, you know, you, you really never know what you're going to run into. And there's all sorts of crazy shit that, you know, when I think about... The, so, you know, the failures and the successes I've had in life. Uh, a lot of the successes, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I did put in the 12 hours of work for a really, really long period of time before I ever got to the point where I could actually leave work before the end of the day. You know, it was a good, it was a good 10 years, or 9 or 10 years into my business before I had the ability to actually leave at, uh, you know, like leave before we closed the gate. And you know, I remember when in the air would go, excuse me, where are you going? Like when I finally got to the point where I could leave before eight o'clock, but she was, she was kidding. She would congratulate me and say, no, you should, you should go out there and live your life before the rest of your hair turns gray. But uh, this is, 
But like that, there's a lot of work that went into it. But a, a good part of it wasn't just the work that I put into it. A lot of it were just these random meetings with random people that I had gotten to know. And just these random collisions that I had in, the, in these situations that I just, I know would not have been there to the same extent if I were living in a town that had 2,000 or 10,000 people. Like this is just running into a random millionaire record label executive that's jealous of my business to some extent because he was speaking to a, a, a felon who slept on the couch in exchange for watching the studio that came up here from Louisiana a few weeks ago. Like that, that's the kind of shit that just kind of happens here. Or, or like just running into some, like all the, and I could have stories like this for days. I could probably walk around here until my battery dies telling weird stories like this or how I met the vice president of sales uh, at Intracil back in 2011. And I had a really good conversation with the vice president of sales at Intracil in 2011. I, you know, these types of things, they're just, they're things that happen in these areas with high population density that also just so happen to have a really, really, uh, lots of wealth, lots of tech companies, lots of art, lots of everything else. Like when you have this type of, this level of population density that's unmatched even in San Francisco, combined with the amount of wealth that you have here, there's just a lot of different crazy opportunities. The downside of it, obviously, is that you live a crazier life. You spend a lot more money on your rent. You deal with a lot more aggravating, incompetent government regulation and policy. Uh, there's, even if you have less crime as a percentage because you have so many people, there's still more overall crime because, you know, just uh, per square foot because you have so many more effing people. You know, New York City actually has a very low crime rate, but the only reason it has a lower crime rate is because, by percentage, is because you have 8 million people in a space the size of Knoxville, Tennessee. So, that's what, what I would say is the good thing about New York. Now, is this still true today with the amount of businesses that have closed, with the amount of places that have cleared out? I don't know. But no matter where I go in the United States and no matter where I go in the world, I will always have a soft spot in my heart for New York City for presenting me with the opportunities that it presented me with. It was on me to grab those opportunities. It was on me to do the 12 to 15 hours a day of work for years and years to turn those opportunities into something. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much I'm willing to do. It doesn't matter how long I'm willing to stay up. It doesn't matter how much I'm willing to bang my head against the wall if there's no opportunity in front of me. And New York City always had opportunity to put in front of me. And there are a lot more that I haven't discussed in this video. There's a bunch more that I could discuss if I, if I wasn't left to like a quarter of a battery bar here. of like, you know, showing an Altoids headphone amp that I had built when I was 16 using a Seamoy diagram that I found on HeadFi and, and showing that to a job interviewer or something in the, in, the, in the elevator of Avatar Studios and that getting me a job that led to me sitting next to the, you know, the Ricky Beagans and the Phillips Combses and the Gretchen Mathwiches of the world so that I could learn how to be a good diagnostic component level repair technician. All this kind of really, really cool stuff. It, these are the opportunities that happened here, that New York put in front of me, that I just, I don't think would have been put in front of me if I grew up in a town of 10,000 people. And again, that's always going to come with its downsides, but it definitely came with a lot of upside. And, you know, just being able to have a business where I could see 20 items a day as someone who's working out of his apartment in basketball shorts. Because you have to think about it. One of the ways that I learned how to do a lot of what I did is I, I had a lot of devices. I was able to, one of the ways I was able to figure out, okay, this is a common flaw here. This is a common flaw that always happens in that device is because I got to see so many of them. You know, if you live in an area where you see a particular device, maybe once every two months, it's really difficult to, you know, cut your teeth on it and really learn the way you do if you see 20 or 30 of them a day. You know, the uh, density is a big part of what made it easy for me to become an expert. Some people can become an expert just by studying one particular device in one particular case, and that's not me. I'm only, you know, I'm able to become an expert if I can study it, you know, over and over and over and over again. Sorry, the, speaking of the New Yorker and me, I just can't help myself. That's a suggestion. <laughs> 
We're not a full electrical ve electric vehicle yet, so I'm sure I'd hear if something was coming down there. Maybe in 30 years, I'll just get sliced at 180 miles an hour when a smart EV just comes running down there and I don't hear it and I'm dead, but eh, not yet. So I would say that's the good side of New York. The population density, combined with the wealth, combined with the attraction of artistic talent, technical talent, intellectual talent, and also all the weird people that just get attracted to a place like this for whatever reason, it really winds up presenting you with a lot of opportunities and an interesting life. A very, very, very interesting life. And some people want their, I completely understand and respect, want their life to be less interesting. They want their life to be a life that, uh, you know, they know how they're going to wake up. They know how they're going to go to sleep for the most part. They know what to expect. They know who their neighbors are. No crazy shit. For me, I, I grew up in an environment where I was open to anything but the same old shit. I didn't want the same old shit. I wanted something new. I wanted something different. I wanted pretty much the opposite of whatever it was that I grew up with. And I, so, you know, the moment I was able to legally leave, I left. And I uh, started, you know, just working my ass off, interning my ass off, and living in crap, you know, crappy, dumpy places just to be able to experiment and figure out what opportunities were out there. And honestly, the really good opportunities, it was a good three to four years. Three, it was at least three or four years of just kind of bumbling around before anything even remotely decent came my way. But I had to be bumbling around for that time in order to be in the room for when the good opportunities came my way. But, you know, and there are people that I knew that started with me at the same place that I started in the same company, same stuff, that I, they had to kind of fumble around a little bit longer, like one of my best friends. It took like, you know, an additional two or four years before he kind of figured out where he fit in the world. But it was the same thing, you know, he grew up broke and uh, he didn't, you know, but he was willing to just grind and work 12 to 15 hours every single day and try to figure out what his place in the world was, what he was good at how to get better at it, how to be the best at it. And, you know, he has his own business now and he grinds away. He has a... And eventually, you kind of, at some point, you get to a point where the benefits of all the opportunity and all the stuff being available to you don't really matter as much anymore. And I think that's the point that I am at uh, right now. Because, again, you know, I have a business with worldwide recognition. I have a business where all sorts of people know where I am and they, they, they know who I am, they know where to find me, they know why they should use us over almost anybody else for whatever service that it is that we offer. Like all that stuff's already there. I don't really need to sell myself or explain anything to anybody. But the thing that makes, what was I going to say? I just blinked over there. I flicked a bug off my arm and now I forget what I was saying. Um, but the thing that makes it, no, Ah, but once you finally get to the, you eventually may get to a point where it just, the, the downsides kind of outnumber the up. And that's an area that I am at right now. You know, like I don't need, I don't feel like paying a premium. I don't feel uh, to, 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 to establish myself. I think I've kind of already established myself to some extent. I don't feel like, you know, dealing with asinine people from the city because they can't explain their own laws to me. I don't feel like living you know, if I want to have a middle-class house, spending over a million dollars, kind of that, all that kind of uh, BS. But that's really missing out on the, the hindsight. And the hindsight's kind of important. Because I think that people that kind of clown on New York in the comments section, they don't understand that there's a good side and a bad side. And for me, I'm at that point in the curve where it really just kind of does make, it, do, it does make sense to, you know, look elsewhere. But in the beginning, honestly, I can't think of a place that I would have rather have been. And I always had my eye on the escape plan. I always had my eye on here's what I can and should be doing now to ensure that I have the option at some point in the future, that I have the option, a little break glass and exit there so that, you know, at some point... I don't lose my sanity entirely and have the ability to go someplace that's quiet and tranquil and still have a life. But yeah, in the beginning, I can't think of a place that I, I, I would have rather been than New York City. 
Now, the real question is going to be, is the New York City that's going to develop over the next 10 years going to be the same New York City with the same opportunity that I grew up in? And that's an excellent question. That's going to depend on a number of things. And that's why it uh, pisses me off to see what has been happening to the city over the past five to 10 years. Because a city that has no small business, a city that has no retail stores, a city that has no small, no, no, no offices, uh, that's, I mean, there's not going to be much opportunity for the next person. Because like a lot of my customers, they were people that worked in small stores. They were people that started companies that did all different types of stuff. And if all these offices become vacant, if all these storefronts are vacant, then where are the people that would be my customers? Where are the people that would be paying the people that become my customers? That's an excellent question. And that's a question that needs to get answered if we're still going to call New York, New York City, a land of opportunity. I want it to be that land of opportunity, that little beacon of hope for the next group of people. I mean, it's, it's always going to be a crazy place. When you have that level of population density, it's always going to be a crazy place with crazy stories. You're going to have crazy regulations because when you have crazy population density, you have a higher chance that crazy people are going to do crazy shit. And when you have lots of people trying to do crazy shit, you need more rules. And this saying, you know, every single rule has an asshole attached to it, meaning that you didn't have to make something a rule until someone was an asshole. Like, you probably didn't need to have red and green lights until somebody, I don't know, you didn't have to have a stop sign until someone went 80 miles an hour and just blew through a pedestrian. You know, like, every single rule that comes up comes up because there was someone beforehand that was an asshole that made the requirement for there to be a rule. And you're, you're going to have more legislation, regulation, and red tape in cities because you have so many more people in close proximity to one another, which increases the likelihood that you're going to be dealing with assholes. But you're all, it also increases the likelihood that you're going to have opportunity just literally bump into you and you're not even expecting it. And, you know, I think this, this really does tie into the real estate videos and things that I do with the real estate, you know, just showing all the empty crap, because if that is not focused on, if that is not fixed, if that, if that bubble does not burst, then it's going to be much harder for the next version of me that's starting out in 2022, as opposed to starting out in 2008, to get their start, to find their client base, to find their way in the world. Because that's one of the things that makes the city great. When all of those places were full, when all of those places were open, when all those places were rocking and rolling with actual business, with paying people, there's a lot of potential customers. There's a lot of potential ideas that you could sell to those, to those businesses and to those people doing things. But that doesn't exist if you walk down the street and everything is fucking empty because every landlord thinks that their shit is worth seven to, seven to $1,000 a square foot when it's not. Anyway, you guys are probably pissed at me continuously pointing the camera at the ground. I'm honestly just walking around. I'm not even looking at this camera, to be honest with you. I'm just kind of thinking. Uh, you let me know what you think in the comments down below. That's it for today. And as always, hope you learned something. I'm going to get going back to the Holiday Inn that I call home. And just say thank you very much to the Marriott and Best Western parking lot for not calling the cops on this guy that's been talking to himself for the past half hour in the parking lot. See y'all later.